I submit to you that more heads of government around the world today worry about what Ben Bernanke is likely to say tomorrow than Chuck Hagel or John Kerry. We live in the world of geoeconomics. I think it is Samuel Huntington who said two decades ago in an essay entitled The Primacy of What Determines the Primacy of Nations that economic activity is probably the most important source of power. All the major shifts in the world's military power balances, Paul Kennedy reminded us on the eve of the end of the Cold War, have fol followed alterations in what he called productive balances as opposed to military balances. The rising and falling of the various empires and states in the international system, said Paul Kennedy, has been confirmed by the outcomes of the major great power wars where victory has always gone to the side with the greatest material resources. Without doubt, victory in the Cold War did go to the side with the greatest material resources, though that cannot be said for the many military conflicts that dotted the Cold War, most famously the Vietnam War. Building on Kennedy's theory of productive balances between nations as opposed to military balances, Edward Luthwak wrote a classic essay around 1990 in which he asserted that the methods of commerce are displacing military methods with disposable capital in lieu of firepower, civilian innovation in lieu of military technical advancement, and market penetration in lieu of garrisons and bases. States as spatial entities structured to jealously delimit their own territories will not disappear but reorient themselves towards geoeconomics in order to compensate for their de decaying geopolitical roles. In a world in which military conflict between major states is increasingly regarded as unlikely, I think Huntington's assertion that economic power will be increasingly important in determining the primacy or subordination of states is increasingly visible to us. If in the realm of military competition, the instruments of power are missiles, planes, warships, bombs, tanks, etc., Huntington said, the instruments of power uh, in the contemporary world are productive efficiency, market control, current account surpluses, strong currencies, foreign exchange reserves, ownership of foreign companies, factories, markets, and access to resources. Clearly, most influential theories of power in international relations conclude, concluded at the end of the Cold War that economic prosperity and productivity were key to national power and international primacy. And why not? After all, the Cold War ended not because the United States won on the battlefields of military conflict. In fact, it did not. In Vietnam, the US power was actually vanquished. Uh, in Africa, US allies were the losers, and so on and so forth. Yet the US emerged as a stronger power because of its economic primacy. It is its technological edge, its openness to migration and the inflow of alien talent, and its ability to build new institutions, rules, and alliances, as in Asia, that promoted growth and innovation that enabled the US to remain the world's dominant power despite the purely military and political setbacks that visited the United States during the closing decades of the 20th century. The second important geoeconomic phenomenon of that period was quite obviously the rise of, or the resurgence of Germany and Japan. The German reunification was as much a testimony to West Germany's economic appeal as to its social and political appeal to the citizens of East Germany. That West Germany could finance the reconstruction of East Germany made all the difference, not just to Germany, but to the success of the European Union as a whole. We see today, once again, both in Germany and Japan, a new confidence based not on their military power or political alliances, but their economic resurgence. If Angela Merkel has drawn attention to Germany's geoeconomic power in Europe, over the last couple of years, Shinzo Abe has unleashed what Haizo Takenaka, a member of the IISS Council, uh, said in a lecture in Mumbai, the IISS overall lectures, 
um, the new economics of, uh, of, of, of Japan's resurgence, uh, which the media calls Abenomics, is the new geoeconomics of East Asia. Both Germany and Japan have realized that the key to power in, emer in the emerging global system is economic capability and competitiveness. By far the most important geoeconomic phenomenon of our times has without doubt been the rise of China. Let me say as an aside that for all the accolades that Henry Kissinger receives as a grand strategist, he completely missed the point in aligning with China against the Soviet Union to realize that the Soviet Union was, was about to experience a massive economic collapse, which is what ended the Cold War, and that US alliance, in fact, facilitated the economic rise of China, which is today the problem that the US deals with as it tries to restore some balance to the global system. In other words, uh, in winning the Cold War, um, the US, in fact, created for itself the new competition in the form of China's rise. And it's the geoeconomic rise of China rather than the geopolitical collapse or, or uh, dec uh, decline of Soviet power, uh, which is today a far greater challenge uh, to the West than anything um, that, the, that the Soviets posed during the Cold War. The world has been witness over the past two decades to this historical shift in the locus of, of economic development from the West uh, to the East. What are the factors that are driving this shift? I identify, and in the geoeconomics program at the IISS, we've had a succession of conferences over the last couple of years. We have identified five essential elements that define, that that could be called the geoeconomic drivers of strategic change, which is the subject of this morning session. First and foremost, of course, are demographics. Demographics define uh, economic competitiveness, the size and quality of workforce, fiscal capability of, of governments because of their ability to raise revenues or the commitment to spend. It's demographics. Uh, that explains a, a lot of the shift of economic activity, that explains the problem Europe faces, that explains the opportunities that emerging markets offer. Demographics clearly are the most important uh, geoeconomic driver of strategic change. Nation states can deal with the um, problems posed by demographics. For example, the United States by remaining open to in-migration of both skilled and unskilled labor, has systematically dealt with the problem imposed by demographic transition. While on the other hand, countries in Europe and even Japan have not been able to adequately deal with the challenge of demographic change uh, by not being open to in-migration of talent. Um, there's an interesting quote from Milton Friedman in an essay that, in a report that he wrote for Jawaharlal Nehru in 1955, Friedman had said that the great untapped, and this is a quote, the great untapped resource of technical and scientific knowledge available to India at that time for the taking is the equivalent of the untapped continental uh, resources available to the United States for 150 years. This is the essence of the demographic transition to convert people from being viewed as liabilities to people as being viewed as assets. And, and that's the transition that many of the Asian economies have been able to make by investing in what Amartya Sen calls human capabilities. The second geoeconomic driver, in a sense deriving from the first, is fiscal capacity and fiscal capability of the state. States that retain fiscal capability are able to invest uh, in nation building, in technological change, and in, in their military capability. But quite clearly, states that do not have the fiscal capability or where that fiscal capability gets degraded, uh, their strategic potential is, quite, is, 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 is brought into question. The third geoeconomic driver is technological change. And technological change, of course, related to the nature of, of uh, investment in human capability and the deployment of fiscal resources. 
But technological change uh, is also related to the structure of intellectual property rights, uh, to the access to resources, uh, particularly human resources. The fourth geoeconomic driver um, are resources, uh, available resources, whether it's water or food or oil, energy, and the massive biodiversity that continental economies like the United States um, uh, are capable of, of uh, getting access to. And finally, of course, markets. Markets have always been a geoeconomic driver from the time uh, trade followed the flag and uh, subsequently flag followed trade. Uh, access to market, uh, acquisition of markets has been an important geoeconomic driver of strategic change. There is, however, nothing mechanical about the process of strategic change. In other words, the economic accelerators and decelerators that influence geoeconomic drivers are subject to human, that is, policy intervention. For example, the logic of demographics can be altered by the proactive migration policies, just as they can be altered by new technologies. As I've said, the United States has, is a good example of a country that has been able to use this. Apart from in-migration, access to new uh, energy-saving or resource-saving technologies, as you've seen in the case of Japan, can also alter the logic of uh, demographic transition. Demographics can impact the fiscal capacity of nation states. Aging societies become less fiscally flexible. And, and fiscal capacity of the state is something that increasingly challenges uh, countries around the world. Our next geoeconomics conference uh, in Bahrain next month uh, asked this question whether the fiscal incapacity or incapability or constraint on states uh, is in fact influencing their defense strategies, military expenditure, and therefore their uh, geopolitical uh, options available for states. Uh, it, in fact, a couple of thousand years ago, uh, Kautilya, a famous Indian uh, thinker, wrote that the strength, from the strength of the treasury, the army is born. And, and that is the essence uh, of the challenge that uh, states uh, are increasingly facing. And that indeed is a geoeconomic challenge. The, ability of states to mobilize fiscal uh, resources in order to be able to protect their geopolitical interests. There are, of course, resources, and resources uh, define, uh, to a great extent, uh, the ge geoeconomics and the geopolitics of our times, energy being one, one example. We have a session on energy uh, later today. But finally, the the most important, the original geoeconomic um, factor driving geopolitics, namely the search for markets, has come back in, in, a, in a stark way to confront us today in the kind of uh, choices that governments are beginning to make with respect to the global multilateral trading system. I think it's Pascal Lamy who observed uh, here at the IISS when he addressed us uh, last year um, in, in London, that there is a shift today in the balance of power in the multilateral trading system. And that is not a geopolitical shift, that's a geoeconomic shift. The consequences of that shift in the, in the balance of power in the multilateral trading system is that we have a new geoeconomic phenomenon, uh, which is regionalism. The Trans-Pacific Partnership in Asia the transatlantic uh, trade and investment partnership across the Atlantic, the regional comprehensive economic partnership uh, that ASEAN, China, India, and others have put together are all new forms in which countries are seeking to protect and widen their markets. And this poses a major geoeconomic challenge of our times. How nations are going to deal with this challenge, whether the WTO system is finally going to collapse under the weight of regionalism. Those of you who follow this will know that the WTO created an exception for regional groups, uh, believing that regional trading groups are what were called building blocks of multilateralism. That was a theory behind uh, the WTO's acceptance of regionalism. But from, become, from being building blocks of regionalism, we find today regional, uh, sorry, from being building blocks of multilateralism, we find regionalism uh, may well be the hammer that actually knocks down 
multilateralism, and that is, in my view, uh, the most important geopolitical, uh, geoeconomic challenge uh, of this year. Uh, and we will see what happens in Bali uh, in December, whether the WTO system is, is able to sustain itself and remain relevant, or is going to come down under the weight of, of, uh, of regionalism, uh, where economics uh, is beginning to challenge, um, or, or where, where geopolitics is beginning to challenge uh, globalization. Thank you.